let's see here, let me get my... So when I began to research for this lecture, the first thing that happened was I couldn't find what love is, at least not very quickly. So let's define love. What does it mean? Does it mean I deeply love you? Well, what does that mean? Does it mean I deeply care for you? If I deeply care for you, does it necessarily mean I deeply love you? So it's confusing. Normally, I know I've said this a million times, I love this ice cream. Well, I don't think that's the description of love that we're talking about, but it, uh, it is enjoyment. I love your dress. Well, we like pretty things, so we're constantly saying we love it. I love your sexy body. Eh, that one usually is a little lusty. So what we're going to do, and I'm going to take you through time, um, all the way from the beginning of the definition of love through world love today, or universal love. Let's see. <laughs> so we're going to start with our first little exercise. And the reason that I brought this up is because, and I'm, it's going to be a little bit different from what you've normally done, but meditation um, ma many people have different definitions for meditation, but basically it's quieting the mind and quieting your physical senses so that you can hear the language of love. So you can actually um, talk to God and you can actually stop obsessing over certain thoughts and you uh, lessen your worries, lessen your doubts, because it puts you in a moment of silence and a moment of balance. And it's also a moment where we are quieting our minds so we can talk to God and ask Him to please help us with our desires and our intentions and at the same time telling Him that what we are willing to do in order to get these desires and go back into silence and listen. But I'm going to teach you a very, very simple, and we're only going to do it one minute because of time constraint, but this exercise is fabulous and what it does, it actually um, balances your left and your right brain. So it balances your mind and your heart. And the reason I want to teach you, even if it's only one minute, is so that we're all balanced today and we receive not only the message intellectually, but the message emotionally that we're here to receive. So it's very simple. We're going to grab our fingers like this and we're going to put our thumb on our right nostril and we're going to breathe in. So we're going to go then we're going to put our index finger on the left nostril and breathe out. And then we're going to breathe in and we're going to change again. Did everybody get that? So I'm going to actually breathe really hard. I don't normally breathe so hard, but so that you can hear it. And we're going to do this for one minute. Close your eyes and only pay attention to what you're doing so that your mind stops thinking for a moment. So again, we're going to put our thumb on our right nostril and we're going to breathe in with the left nostril. Put the index finger on the left and breathe out through the right. Change again. Breathe out through the left nostril. Breathe in, close the left nostril. And you can open your eyes. What that does is basically put you, I don't know if you can feel it, we only did one minute, obviously, you should do it a little bit longer, um, but that actually puts you in a very balanced state, and we are going to talk about balance because love is always in balance and in harmony. So like I said, in the beginning, there were the Ten Commandments, and what we're going to see is that the Ten Commandments basically love summarizes the intent of the Ten Commandments in two of the commandments, which are going to be, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. In those two commandments, we're going to see that love encompasses 
everything. Now the rest of the commandments, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, were commandments that at the time of Moses people needed to hear. Hopefully all of us nowadays know that it's common sense um, not to go, not even, <clears throat> excuse me, even though it happens all the time. But um, again, the, the, this was the purpose of God's law is love. And God, as defined by Spiritism, if we recall from our studies, um, God is supreme intelligence, the first cause of everything. So God is eternal, immutable, immaterial, unique, omnipotent, supremely just and good. So when we see that description, I think that we can equate that to love. God is love. I loved this poster. That love thy neighbor thing, I meant it, God. <laughs> How many times that we don't really pay attention to it. But that's basically the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Now, we can change that. We can say, he who looks for love will find it by giving it. Which is kind of the same thing. Do unto others as you would like others to do unto you. Because when we give love, we receive love. Um, I think it was Sherry that just said, when you perceive the light in someone, you see the light within yourself. And it's true. This is uh, the, the rule. Um, the, only, the only desire of love really is to give. Okay, so giving, we call it sometimes charity. We call it service. Um, giving basically is giving without taking. That's what it means. Once, whenever we give, whenever we give love or we give anything at all, um, we should do it without any motive other than to give and to give our love to other people. Selfishness. This is actually, when I was looking in the Spirit's book, this is actually the direct opposite of love. So I, have to, I had to put my glasses on because obviously I couldn't see. <laughs> so the spirits sent, gave a message. And the message bas basically is selfishness, the plague of humanity, must disappear from the earth whose moral progress is hindering. Selfishness is the target at which all believers should point their arms, towards which all strength and courage should be directed. And I, I picked those sentences in particular because it takes courage to do the right thing. And we'll see why. Um, selfishness basically is the total denial of charity, the total denial of service and giving. What happens when we're selfish? I mean, I guess we are all selfish at times. So what, what really happens when we're selfish? So we really haven't understood the concept that we're all connected. There isn't anything that we can do. If we harm somebody, we are harming ourselves. There's just no other way around it. We haven't realized that yet. Once we realize that, it'll be much easier to love each other because we'll avoid a lot of suffering. John's favorite word. <laughs> um, so we must eliminate the problem of selfishness if we want to create harmony and unity um, and peace for mankind. So I go back to what the Spirit said. It takes courage to do the right thing. So what happens, and we're gonna, I divided it into these um, sections here because I just thought it was interesting. But the law of spiritual justice, when we substitute it for the selfish law of the funnel, which basically is the law of the funnel. When we think that we have what we need, nobody else really needs it. And an example of that is uh, healthcare. I have healthcare, I have a great salary. Heck, it covers everything. So what if you don't have healthcare? Look how difficult it's been for us to implement Obamacare. And all we're trying to do is take care of our people. But we, we tend to substitute that selfish law and to take the privileges. We think that we should have privileges that we don't care whether other people suffer or not. So 
the law of love, we normally substitute with the law of wealth and success. And that's when we decide the material things are more important than love. Um, when we do that, we create a real imbalance with um, uh, balance and equality don't exist at this point. So we believe that if we have more things, we're better. And we equate that with being successful and love. But it truly generates unhappiness and suffering. The law of free will. This is a really good one. We substitute this one for the law of the strongest. And what does that mean? Well, look at our politicians. They have power. They're strong. They use their power to convince people of things that sometimes are not really true. But people believe them because they're people in power. So they're actually manipulating a lot of the society, a lot of the people in the world to believe something that's false. Um, that happens a lot and you know makes people fanatical. And I'm not going to mention any particular news media, but we have some nowadays that we watch that really influence people's thoughts. You know, it's really hard for us to really admit our own selfishness because we don't like it when people give us advice. We don't like it when people tell us you're being selfish or you really should change, you shouldn't do that. We prefer flattery and praise, even if it is a lie. So what happens with selfishness is if we're not willing to look within ourselves and to find the love within ourselves, we become stagnant and we don't progress. We don't go backwards, but we also aren't going forwards. So we want to look within ourselves to be able to um, move forward from selfishness. Now, next is there are the states of e egoism, which is vanity, pride, and arrogance. The essence of vanity is the desire for prominence, wanting to be more than others. The essence of pride is fear to be known just as you are. The essence of arrogance is the lack of humility. So as um, Marcelo uh, prayed today, let us be humble. It's very difficult for a lot of us to be humble nowadays because we're just not that evolved. We're just not that aware yet. But there, are hum there have been humble people in the world. And humility basically comes from forgetting yourself. And really, when we forget ourselves, we are completely in tune with the other person giving love. Um, the first step to truly want love is really, again, to recognize the selfishness within us and to become humble. So that's our job. We need to constantly be aware. Um, whatever we think, whatever our, whatever our thoughts are, basically is who we become. So if there's something about you that you don't like, look at it carefully and try to change it. Love and look, love, kindness, uh, loyalty, integrity, humbleness, all of those things give our soul freedom. And the freedom, within that freedom is love. I keep on repeating love because that's the title of my slideshow. <laughs> The path of love. So once we start working on this selfishness, there has to be something that guides us through it. And so the path of love basically is when we walk this path of love, we feel happy, we feel balanced, nothing can go wrong. The sun shines even during thunderstorms here in Miami, everything is, is beautiful. When we walk the path of hate, we feel lonely and apart, and nothing can make us feel good. This is a lot of times when depression comes in, when we feel very lonely. When we walk the path, the path of fear, we feel that the, we die a thousand deaths of self-doubt and illness. And believe me, we all go through it at some level, at some time in our life. When we walk the path of greed, we we, are, we get sick with self-deceit, and we're in prison from the light of which is love. So with that, this quote here actually basically summarizes it. Love is the only freedom in the world 
because it so elevates the spirit that the laws of humanity and the phenomena of nature do not alter its course. I thought that was just a beautiful quote that sort of summarized everything that we said. So what happens if we actually have everything? What happens if I have a beautiful house, a great husband, smart kids, a Rolls Royce? I have it all, and there's still something missing. Well, I hate to tell you this, but it happens to a lot of us, and that's the search that we're all after. Well, we're eternally, from the time we're born, looking for love in all the wrong places. So like the music, sa the song says, um, money can't buy you love. And it's true. So we, when, that is, when we're feeling this way, we need to really understand the why of all things and to understand and to truly know what love is. And love, I, I, I'm sure a lot of you have received my emails, and at the bottom I say, whatever the question, love is the answer. And if we could just always remember that and keep that in mind, it's so true. Because we, we have to realize that, it, again, we go back to it is in giving that we are re-given. So when we're, we're taking and taking material things and we have the house, we have the money, we have the kids, it's very empty. What after that? Next exercise. So I do this exercise a little differently um, when I'm on a one-on-one, -on -one. but since we're in a group, what I want you to do is with the person next to you, we're going to do this exercise together. And it's called a heart-to-heart -heart because what we're going to do is our hearts are going to resonate in the same sound, which is the ah. So our, the heart chakra resonates in the ah. By the way, the universe, the sound of the universe is ohm. And NASA actually recorded the sound of the universe. But the sound of the heart is ah, and even though I can't sing, I was told by a teacher once that anybody can do one sound in tune. So we're all going to do the sound ah. But before we do that, I want you to understand that the heart chakra from a physical level affects your lungs and it affects your heart. So if you're having palpitations or you're having breathing problems, it's also a really good time to do this sound all by yourself, okay? If you're having um, any kind of an emotional problem, if you have grief or sadness, it's also a good time to do this sound. So this is the sound of love. But what I want you to do right now is pair up and look at each other's eyes, and we're going to do the sound of ah uh, three times, okay? <laughs> Fatima, do you want to do it with me? Oh, yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. All right, so we're going to look in each other's eyes, and I'm going to go ahead and say it nice and loud so you can hear. Come here so they can do it. Okay. Okay, so we're, we're going to start now. Look at each other. One, two, three. actually make you vibrate a little bit inside and it's also really a great exercise to do with your mate if there's something wrong and you're having a hard time communicating um, you can do that and you can hold hands you can do it in different ways it's just that in a public way we we don't touch <laughs> 
Okay, so speaking of mates, because um, I wanted to go into every aspect of love. And of course, um, it, um, the aspect of relationships is very important because we are constantly in relationships. Now I'm going to read this one because um, true mates experience moments of oneness with all eternity when they reach that moment of complete unawareness of body sensing. I'm sure that all of you have been in that moment where there's so much love that four hours went by and you thought it was five minutes. That's what they mean by unawareness of body sensing. So um, relationships are an important part of teaching us about love. Se uh, um, sexual relations or, or relationships that are close usually go through three different stages because sometimes it's hard for us to understand the love there. But when we're teenagers, the balance is more physical and mental and spiritual. As we have children and we get married, we're in that middle age, the, it balances out much more. So the balance between physical, emotional, and spiritual love is all coexisting together. By the time we reach old age, we are very much in a wonderful, beautiful, mental, and spiritual place. And the relationships just grow. That's why it's so beautiful to watch relationships grow as time goes on. When you see two little old people and you think they're so cute. Uh, it, it's because they, they grow into that kind of love. Um, so there, there is actually a cause and effect of love. A, maybe I made it up. A law of cause and effect of love. Uh, but basically the, what I'm trying to say is that the cause of everything is love. The affection and the closeness is an effect of that love. So that's why it's so important when you do share intimately with somebody that you do it with love. Exercise number three. This is a very fun exercise. and My husband has the cue. He's supposed to pass the rubber bands around. Everybody needs to have a rubber band. While, they're, while you're passing the rubber bands around, I'm going to tell you why. When you have tension in any kind of a relationship, and for tension, I mean when you have any kind of anger, hatred, jealousy, fear, all of those things create tension. So when I speak about tension, that's what I'm talking about. When you have tension, you can't be happy. And when you're not happy, it's really hard to feel love towards yourself or anybody else. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult. And our natural state, the natural state of God, the natural state of love is to be in balance. So I want you to grab those, the rubber bands. And the first thing I want you to do, I'll wait until everybody has it. Um, I'm, going, I'm going to actually tell you a story. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example while, while you're passing it around. If you're standing up straight, you're in balance. If you move just three degrees sideways and try walking around all day like that, you'll be really moody at the end of the day. <laughs> it's not very easy to do because you're creating tension. Okay, so I think everybody has a rubber band now. What I want you to do is pull the rubber band. Okay, this is tension. How do you feel? You, you, your body can feel it, right, in your arms. So if the tension continues and you keep on stretching it, eventually it will burst, right? We don't want it to burst here because it hurts. But if we release the tension, we go back into balance. And I wanted you to feel this because I'm going to tell you a story so that you can relate to tension in your own life. So this is a true story, actually. There was a, a couple who they were very, very happy. And they'd been married and everything was going well in their family, in their house. And one day the husband calls up from work and says, honey, I'm going to be late. And he told her a million times that he was going to be late, but today 
something was different. And some tension created inside of her. She had heard gossip that she didn't pay any attention. She completely trusted her husband, but that phone call created tension. Now, she didn't release the tension right away. The thing to, that she should have done is, when he came home, said, honey, let's talk about it. What's going on? To see if they could release the tension. Instead, she kept the tension. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Three days later, she calls up mom. This rubber band is starting to bust. Mom consoles her. Mom tells her wonderful things, calls him bad names. She feels better temporarily. But what has happened is that she's created double tension. Because now mom is also has tension. Mom is worried that her daughter is not happy. Daughter still hasn't confronted the problem. Now she calls up every single friend she has. Home neighborhood knows about it for creating more and more tension. Daddy finds out. We call a lawyer. When we finally decide to confront the situation, mommy, daddy, daughter, and lawyer, and husband are all in the same room. And there's a slight imbalance here. So husband doesn't have any choice. He says, I think the only thing I can do is get divorced. And so now the family is broken. The tension still not relieved. We still haven't, we're still in tension. So it's not so much what the event that caused the tension is about, but it's how we deal with it. We must stop for a moment and be humble, get rid of our pride, and sit down with love, try to confront and talk about the problem and release the tension. So I just want all of you to, whenever you're feeling any kind of tension, it doesn't matter, anything that feels wrong in your body, stop and pause and try to find out what the cause of the tension is and look at it with eyes of love. So we're going now into world love or universal love. And we have Emanuel Swedenborg who writes in the 18th century that surely everyone understands that loving many people in a group involves more love for our neighbor than loving an individual member of the group. So it is easier to love one person than it is a group. But it is our moral responsibility and the moral responsibility of our politicians to work in order to um, serve the people and to create the kind of unity that makes us work together and take care of the, of the people who have less than we do. It's our, we must take care of the less fortunate. We must help our politicians. We must remind our politicians. We must remind our neighbors, everybody around us, that we need to work together. Because only, because we are connected, and only when we realize that your misfortune is also my misfortune, we don't get it. Okay, so. Kindness. Love in action. Isn't that so pretty? So, I love this because it reminds me of a movie that I watched years ago that was called Pass It Forward. And that's really what the snowball effect is. It's the snowball of love when we pass it forward. When we, when we put love into everything that we do, we experience inner joy. And when we experience inner joy, we give inner joy. And when we give it, the snowball starts rolling and going until it becomes a huge snowball of love. So we, need, we must give love in order to get. We must give kindness in order to get kindness. We must give love in order to get love. It's not the other way around. Nobody can give it to us. We have to give it first. That's the law. That's the way it works. Now, if we want, if we want to have world peace, and we want to, or even just peace within our own families and our own neighborhoods, we, we must make sure that this snowball of love gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Otherwise, we will destroy ourselves and our planet. 
I'm going through this really quick because I wanted to give you all the information that might happen. So this is a fantastic story. I read this story when I was actually preparing for the lecture. It was on Twitter. Now there are no accidents. The, I normally would not even look at an article like this, but it was a really interesting, I don't know why I opened it up. And it's reflections of a former white supremacist. He is a racist skinhead and a lead singer of a hate metal band. This guy, just from the time he was in first grade, um, started with this hatred and anger. And he said, that, I'm gonna summarize this a lot, but it's a great story. So he says the main question that everybody asks him is, why did you leave? And he said, I answer it in one word, exhaustion. It's exhausting to be angry and feel hatred all your life, he says, with everybody. He says, I hated everybody. I knew that there was something wrong, but I still hated everybody. And I'm going to read to you what I feel was the paragraph that was interesting. But the most powerful moments that fed the growing sense of exhaustion that led me away from hate were ones rooted in love. Imagine. Time after time during my seven year stint in hate groups, I was graced with kindness and forgiveness by people I was openly hostile to because of who they were. Not even because of what they did, but because of who they were. Refusing to let my inhumanity diminish theirs, people like a Jewish boss, a lesbian supervisor, a black and Latino co-workers modeled what it means to be a human being when I least deserved it, but most needed such a lesson. Now, if you guys don't think God had something to do with that, I don't know. I mean, Im imagine who was being put in his life. But that still didn't quite change him. What really changed him was when he had a daughter and he had never felt that kind of love. And he knew he was either going to end up in prison or he was going to end up dead. And because of his daughter, today, he has formed a group to help kids just like him. It was a beautiful story. So we ask, why is it so hard to evolve? Like for this guy, I mean, things kept on happening and happening and happening to him. And like he says, he did, he did evolve because he became aware, but it still took a lot of work. It wasn't like, oh, one day to the next, I'm, I'm a great guy. So I kind of, I broke it down into to these things here. So Jesus actually came to teach us about unconditional love. But it's so hard for us because we have such big egos and we're so selfish. When we have something that we think is better than what you should have, it's so hard for us to share sometimes. So selfishness and egoism um, get, get in the way. Now, we are constantly progressing, like I said, and in Spiritism, we believe in reincarnation, so we know that it takes thousands and thousands of lives that we can work on it. The problem is, is that we forget when we come back. So sometimes material desires in the new life get in the way again. Why? Because we like things. Who doesn't? It's just the value that we put on things. So then we also have um, scientific and materialistic education. And basically that's when we come in and we say, you know what? It's a waste of time, this spiritual stuff. You know, I'm not getting anything from it. Science is really the only real thing. And, you know, they're just so full of it, these people who are spiritual. So that gets in the way of our evolving or our becoming aware. And then the next thing is a confusion between spirituality and religion. So a lot of us come in and we believe, and a lot of people still do believe, that if you do a certain rituals, we're in God's grace we will go to heaven. We don't really have to do anything except for these rituals. So we become confused. What does it really mean to study spirituality, to study spiritism, to really work at it all the time? And it is a work in progress, and it is a necessary work um, to every day, because it's not just what we're reading and what we're learning in books, it's how we're living.
These are a few things that we can do when we choose love. And it's a whole list, but basically, you know, we need to stop being resentful, jealous, dramatic, lazy, being full of excuses. So there's actually a, a list, a nice list if you forget that you can actually look up and you can find what to do. Love is the foundation actually of the universe. I put world there, but after I did that, I thought, you know, actually it's the foundation of the entire universe. And the destiny of our spirit is to reach happiness through experiencing unconditional love and through free will because that's what we've been given, the free will. Um, so love, without love there is no evolution. Without love there is no wisdom. Without love there is no happiness. Actually without love there is no awareness because we're just not aware of what's around us and what surrounds us. Love is, the, is re, the revitalizing and harmonizing force from the spiritual universe from God or source, however you prefer. Last exercise. So the thymus, this is the thymus thump, and our thymus gland, as you all know, um, is big when we're young, but as we grow older, it becomes smaller, and the only way we can actually activate it is by um, thumping it. Now, the reason we want to thump it is because it's also our emotional gland. So when we are feeling fear or we are feeling sad, the best way to do it is actually looking at yourself in the mirror and smiling and thumping. Because you will crack up laughing when you look at yourself. And when you're laughing, you can't be sad. So it changes, it completely changes your vibration and your frequency and you're more likely to go out there and be kind and be loving and be accepting of other people. Now, one, before we do it, I just also want to bring up in the Catholic Church, we go mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. And that actually does make us feel better. Even though I don't think they knew what they were doing, but it, it's because we were thumping the thymus gland. So I just want everybody right now to look at each other again and thump, smile and thump. And we're just going to do that for a little bit. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> so that's another great little exercise that you can, especially when you're going to work and the coworker is being nasty to you, just go in the bathroom and look at yourself. <laughs> So in, in conclusion, God is love. At least that's what I understood from it after I did all of the research and after I really put my, my heart into it, I realized that's what it's all about. And I love this beautiful um, quote from Leo Russell. It says, deep within man's consciousness is the knowledge that love is all there is, for love is God, and God is all there is. And we all come from God. So that is all there is. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you take home a little something with you. Thank you. <laughs>